I looked on the previous weeks, unable to identify any concrete evidence that suggested she was cheating. My sensation of worry stemmed from a series of minor situations that combined to leave me feeling uneasy. While I had a strong suspicion that something was wrong, I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was. I lacked proof and information on who, what, or where it might be happening. Doubts about my own sanity arose, wondering if I was overreacting or creating scenarios of her cheating. Despite my doubt, my stomach was in turmoil, indicating that something was going on. It could be the beginning of a fling or a fair or even a one-time experience. Surprisingly, the more I reflected about these ideas, the more convinced I got. I'd been dealing with these problems for what seemed like weeks. But how long had the situation been going on before I became aware that anything was wrong? I took another sip of my jade and signaled the bartender, who nodded with a half-smile. After seeing that disturbed expression several times before studying the silent bar filled with unclear chatter, I noticed a lack of enthusiasm. The customers' faces were plain, drab, and average. The only woman in the room, in her forties and probably overdressed for the occasion, appeared desperate, receiving a drink from an elderly man. But when he looked at her, he seemed hopeful. He didn't have to try so hard. She already had his number. Other diners were simply passing the time while the rain fell outside, depressing emotions even more. Soon, they'd run out of reasons to stay in the bar and return home. I was undecided regarding my next steps. I turned to face the voice and she was staring at me with eyes that seemed to see into my soul as I tried to react. Words eluded me. Sammy began removing her coat in the dimly lit pub, water streaming off her. And I wondered why she was there. Curious. I inquired as to why she was here. Sammy said she was worried about me. Knowing she'd find me at the bar, she proposed we talk. I glanced at her, curious about her motivations. Could I trust her to keep me steady? I took a sip of my jade and ordered her some vodka and soda. We waited for the bartender to go before continuing our discussion, our eyes indicating uncertain tea and a subtle effort for dominance. Sammy mentioned that my recent actions had caught her attention. Sensing the weight of the world on my shoulders, I peered into her brown eyes but soon averted my gaze. We had an unspoken understanding. I told her that everything were okay between us. Despite her efforts to downplay the situation, she remained skeptical. My heart fell when I realized that my efforts to lessen the problem were ineffective. Sammy placed her glass on the tab and leaned slightly forward, locking her fingers together. She said she knew what was going on. I pretended ignorance, but Sammy demanded we move to a booth for privacy. I reluctantly agreed and asked her what she believed she knew. Sammy saw through my bluff as I attempted to shift the discussion, claiming that I couldn't lie to her given our lengthy history. She encouraged me to speak, suggesting that I needed someone to confide in. Update. I'd known Sammy since she was 17. She was a continuous presence and had a crush on me. I first dated her sister, Claire, who was three years older, regardless of their differences. Sammy and I always got along, which occasionally resulted in sibling clashes with Claire over time. Claire and I married after two years and settled into what I saw as an idyllic future, both earning decent jobs. We earned enough for a decent lifestyle. Sammy, my sister-in-law, had enjoyed her late teens and early twenties and, at twenty-five, desired a more mature stage in life. She had evolved into someone who any man would be lucky to be close to. Claire and I had been married for five years, and our anniversary was coming up in another month. Considered whether we'd make it that far. Sammy, a gorgeous woman and a friend besides my sister-in-law, looked at me, my eyes welling up. I struggled to express my emotions as her resounding I know resonated in my head. Sammy stretched across the table, lending support with her fingers that gently stroked mine. As she spoke, I could feel my heart slowly shattering. She implied that if I didn't say it, she would. She believed. She knew she was cheating on me, despite the shocking nature of her words. I stubbornly attempted to assimilate what I understood and its consequences. I resisted hearing any more, convinced myself that if I didn't admit it, it couldn't be occurring, sparing me from the agony of embracing the truth. Sammy noted my glassy-eyed appearance and wondered if it was shock or denial. She emphasized her affection for me and begged me to wake up, implying that there could be a mistake. 
In reaction, I tried to divert her and keep misleading myself. Sammy's eyes flashed with wrath, and she exclaimed, catching the bartender's attention. I told the bartender that everything was well. Sammy apologized for her irritation with me and expressed concern for my well-being. She advised me to grow up and confront the reality of the situation. We emphasized the need of taking action. I agreed to begin, and Sammy expressed her suspicions. She described an event from a few weeks ago when she was with my partner and received a call on her phone. Sammy considered it odd that she left the room to answer the call, given that they were sisters. I nodded, feeling fear, as she continued her story. Sammy said that she checked my partner's phone and found no lock code. The call came from a guy identified as Robert. Sammy knew nothing about Robert or Bob, but he determined to keep an eye out for any future incidents. I inquired about the identity of this Robert or Bob individual, seeking clarity. After roughly a week, Sammy learned who my partner had been messaging. He was someone she knew for years before our relationship started. They apparently reunited through social media or chat services and had been messaging for a few weeks. I admitted that I had no knowledge of these interactions, merely sensing that there were little issues keeping us apart. Sammy acknowledged this, but said it was all part of their plan. Nothing overt, but it appeared like everything was falling into place for them. Curious, I inquired whether it was just a few of buddies messaging each other, possibly reminiscing about past times. Sammy confirmed that it began that way, but suggested that something had changed. I was astonished and inquired if I had observed anything suspicious. I remarked that it felt like circumstances were conspiring to keep us apart, and there was also a clear lack of opportunities for enjoyment. Sammy gazed at me with surprise. I returned her look, waiting for her next words. She begged me to get my head out of the figurative sand, underlining her feelings for me. In reaction, I questioned the scope of the crisis, attempting to determine how far it had progressed. Sammy met my stare and her eyes sparked, delivering tacit affirmation. My indignation began to stew within me, generating a flood of questions regarding when, how, and where these encounters had occurred. Sammy mentioned that she knew my partner had met the other person at least three times in the previous two weeks. Sammy was initially unsure, but he became certain two days ago that the problem had developed. She had lunch with one of her friends who worked with Claire, and some information leaked during their talk. Sammy discovered that Claire had met the guy twice for lunch and at least once for dinner the week before. She inquired if this was consistent with what I had seen or suspected. I glanced at her as I absorbed her words. I called her office a couple of times recently to schedule a noon meeting, but she was either not there or had just left. Was this when she met him? Then, last week, she had that seminar that she had to attend. It was a last-minute arrangement made for after work. She arrived home late that night, after 12 p.m. Thinking back, she had come in complaining that it had taken too long, and the crew had gone for a drink in the hotel bar to unwind before departing. I remember there was no lovemaking that night, and she took a shower before bed. My mind was racing. My head jumbled as I processed these painful facts. Sammy expressed concern, warning me not to do something rash that could result in legal trouble. As I made my selection, I noticed a change in her demeanor. I announced that I would no longer tolerate the situation and swore to terminate it. I confirmed that I would not accept a cheating partner and was determined to hold them both accountable for their conduct. Sammy warned me against rash activities without a plan. Her words had a peculiar way of calming me down and confirming my assumptions. Seeking further information, I asked whether she knew where my boyfriend might be at the time. Sammy verified that she felt my partner was currently with the other person, which is why she sought me out. The wrath returned, pushing me to pound the table. People in the bar turned to look when I signaled the bartender. I asked Sammy if she knew the exact spot. Sammy claimed that she didn't know the exact location, but intended to meet with my partner the next day to get additional information. She added that the other guy is married with children, but she wasn't sure where he lived. She told me that she would try to find out more to help with the matter. I conveyed my gratitude by grabbing for her hand and gripping it warmly while wiping away a tear from her cheek. I thanked her for her assistance, realizing the gravity of the issue for her. Sammy appears worried. When asked about my plans, I told her that I couldn't act on my urges just yet, but that I wanted to put a stop to the problem permanently. 
I guaranteed that both of them will face unremorseful punishment. In the meantime, I plan to reclaim what was rightfully mine and gather proof for my next move. As I completed my JD, I alerted the bartender, passing him a note and instructing him to keep the change. Sammy remained concerned and inquired when I planned to address my spouse. I examined the situation and decided to make some calls the next day while addressing my assets. I reiterated my intention to not give her a single dime. Sammy mentioned the difficulty of being around my spouse, and I said that it had been difficult for the prior few weeks. I suppose that if she hasn't detected any change by now, she probably won't in the future. Sammy stepped up and expressed her wish to leave. I suggested we talk again tomorrow, and she agreed, promising to find out more for me. She put on her coat and I stood to assist her sense her presence. She glanced up at me, tears in her eyes, and she looked so much like her sister. I kissed her cheek and assured her that I would be all right. She grinned and walked away, vanishing into the dark, damp darkness. Sitting back down, I took a deep breath and considered my next steps. One thing was certain. They would pay, and the repercussions would be immediate, harsh, and brutal. Update. I don't remember much after that. I awoke in my own bed with a mouth that resembled the bottom of a parrot cage. My head was still floating as I rose from the bed and rolled over. I realized I was alone, and Claire was nowhere to be seen. My senses gradually awakened when I heard noises downstairs and slid my feet over the side of the bed. I tried to stand and woke up the next morning. I couldn't help but wonder what happened the night before. As I staggered to the bathroom, trying to shake off the grogginess, I began to rouse myself. When I entered the kitchen, I found her and inquired about my condition. In response to her inquiry, I vaguely mentioned drinking with an old acquaintance and getting carried away. Sitting down, I poured some orange juice, drank it, and then poured more. When she pressed on, asking about the friend's identity, my mind began to work. I mentioned a guy named Bob, adding that I'd known him for a long time and that he was in town for business, at the mention of Bob. I caught a spark of something on her face as she turned, so I elaborated, reminiscing our college days and football seasons together. Claire was bewildered, unable to recall Bob. Nonetheless, she tossed it off with indifference. So long as I had fun. It was the first caution sign sitting across from me at the table. I reflected on my talk with Sammy from the night before. I made a casual inquiry about her activities the night before, pretending to be interested. I peered into her eyes as she pretended to be finished with work and heading out for a small lunch and a drink with co-workers. She claimed to have arrived home around 930, expressing concern for me owing to a late meeting. I knew she wasn't home by then because I stayed at home till 10 p.m. decided to go to the bar when enough was enough. This was the second warning indication. She went on to discuss certain duties she needed to perform in the morning and hinted that it was late in the evening. Bob, an old acquaintance, was anticipated to contact them and they planned to catch up. I proposed inviting Bob over, emphasizing the pleasure of reuniting with old friends. She agreed and inquired whether I remembered him using an endearing nickname. She looked at me with a bland expression, striving to disguise her reaction. But I detected something beneath the surface. Despite her poker face, I sensed a trace of emotion. I rebuffed her request to invite Bob over, assuring her that I would manage on my own. I decided to get ready for the day by drinking more orange juice and taking a couple of painkillers before leaving the house, ensuring that I didn't miss the opportunity to pick up my car, which had been left at the bar 30 minutes later. I left as Claire proceeded to prepare for her day. As I dressed, I considered the problem. My determination is rising. This couldn't last much longer. I clenched my fist, angered by the prospect of Claire and Bob plotting revenge. I held a strong resentment toward him. The workday was chaotic, with a steady stream of callers dealing with problems on the line. My secretary handled a few calls, but I couldn't dodge important meetings. As the day progressed, the tension within me grew stronger, spurred by a growing need for retaliation. By mid-morning, the initial rush had subsided, and I had almost free time to deal with my personal matters. I closed my office door and began to review my finances. Within 15 minutes, I'd tightened the purse strings and moved some money out of reach. I also scheduled an appointment with a solicitor to discuss a potential divorce. I still had a few days before then, so I figured it would give me time to gather additional information. 
Not that it would matter much, but it could provide me with some leverage. Claire already had her own bank account and credit card, so there was no need to do anything there. Access to our joint account was a worry, but I swiftly closed that loophole. So, if it came to it, she could only get what was left. My own account was secure and had a tiny balance. The rest was moved out and kept safe. We didn't have any children, so if it came to that, we'd just break up. I'd resolved in my mind that we could only get through this if Claire confessed her crimes and sought forgiveness. Any kind of reluctance there. And we were finished. That thought made me sad. I sat at my desk in quiet, reflecting on what had happened and the steps I had made so far today. I required more information about the Bob persona in evidence. Or would the fact that I was aware of it be sufficient to effectively avoid the two of them over the phone? And it was Sammy on the phone. I explained that I was preoccupied with many thoughts and plans, but had taken some action. Sammy gave more information about Bob Stones, revealing that he was married. She received his address and workplace quietly from an acquaintance who saw Claire with him. Despite their best efforts to hide it, they appeared to be becoming closer, according to Samantha. Recognizing the beginning of prospective evidence, I requested Bob's information from Sammy. Within minutes, I found his social media page and downloaded a snapshot. Something about his face felt familiar, evoking a faint memory. Despite the unpleasant feeling, I called Claire about lunchtime and planned to stir the container. During the call, Claire mentioned that she had a meeting with a client named Mr. Stones, which added another layer to the problem. Suppressing my emotions, I kept the conversation light, but her mention of Mr. Stones felt like a tease. I assumed it was strike three. I am determined to take rapid and harsh action against both of them. I'm hanging up the phone. I suppressed my rage by agreeing to visit her later and tolerating her statement of love with clenched jaw. My rage boiled over once the call ended. As I sat there, I clenched my teeth, thinking about the uncomfortable information. My secretary entered, popping her head into the office and offering to get food from the deli down the street. For a minute, I asked her to surprise me with something solid, meaty, and rich in red meat, something I could dig my teeth into. She gave me a strange look but nodded and closed the door behind her. She couldn't shake the notion that something was simmering beneath the surface after noticing my strange conduct throughout the morning. Sammy went to her sister's office and observed Claire leaving the elevator with a tall, dark-haired man around 30 years old. Bob Stones, the man Sammy recognized from his internet photo. Claire was taken aback when she stepped in front of her sister, Sammy, who appeared to be concerned that her plans had been interrupted. Sammy explained her spontaneous visit, citing a desire to see her sister and possibly have lunch. Claire, looking uncomfortable, explained that she and Mr. Stones were having a business lunch and that we meet another time. Mr. Stones presented himself, with Sammy pretending innocence. When asked how long he'd known Claire, he seemed caught off guard. Claire immediately drew him away, saying a conference they had to attend as they exited the building and hailed a waiting taxi. Sammy smiled and looked back at her sister as they drove away. I sat in my office, chewing on a large sandwich stuffed with red meat, smiling to myself as I nodded, gently savoring it while thinking about my next actions. Sammy confirmed that Claire had left her office, so she called her secretary and learned that she would be gone all afternoon. Isn't that great? Everything was in order regarding my finances, and I had a locksmith on fast dial with the terms prearranged. My solicitor was prepared to proceed as soon as I gave him with the remaining information he had required. Okay. Tonight was going to be the first stage. I was going to experiment with the two of them for a bit before pulling the trigger. My father constantly advised me, Don't tell them you're coming for them. Simply go route one, be direct, and destroy the greatest. A man who uses few, if any, direct words. Maybe I had forgotten anything recently, but it was coming. It was on the way. That evening at home, Claire appeared normal, and nothing seemed out of place until I noticed a faint fragrance of men's cologne as I tried to kiss her. She sensed my reaction, and without saying anything, I gave her a gentle kiss on the cheek and walked to the door. Curious, she questioned about my plans, wondering if everything was fine. I assured her that I was all right, but had some business to attend to. I explained that I was going to Jerry's apartment for a poker game with a few co-workers, figuring it would be a good distraction. Closing the door behind me, I got into my car and drove away, 
clenching my teeth in frustration. When I arrived at Jerry's, I parked outside and entered his garage. Jerry, a longtime buddy with a history of dealing with the authorities, was fight-trained, making him the ideal partner for what I was looking for. He was a significant character, a friend from school, and I had contacted him earlier to beg for his help, and he quickly offered it without question. This level of continuous support was precisely what I needed. We swiftly snuck into the garage where I changed into dark overalls and a matching ski mask. We looked like two mime artists standing silently. We didn't say anything as we climbed into a drab old automobile. Jerry had obtained nothing noteworthy. I drove slowly across town to the address Sammy had given me. Still no words were exchanged between us. We had already agreed on the format, so there was no need for more discussion. Jerry parked the car outside Bob Stone's house, and there was no indication of life, only one visible light. We waited silently when the front door opened. We observed him go out, get into his car, and drive slowly down the road. Jerry followed from a safe distance. We already knew where he was going, so there was no rush or worry. Parking on the driving range was no difficulty, and we remained in the car. We sat watching and waiting while the radio played in the background. The strain inside of me was almost terrible, making it difficult to stay still. The want to get outside and roam about was great, but we knew it was unsafe. The parking lot gradually cleared out, leaving only a few cars. Both of us tensed as we watched him walk to his car. Jerry exited and quietly approached the subject. After that, I drove us discreetly out of the parking lot, avoiding drawing attention. Jerry commented on the operation's success as he removed his gloves and mask. I expressed my gratitude, stating that I valued his support. Jerry reassured me not to worry. He claimed that he owed me and could never fully compensate for what I had done for him. I reminded him that friends help one another and pointed out that at least his hands were unharmed and there was no CCTV in the parking lot. We regarded the job nicely done, deciding to return. Jerry proposed starting a card game with the others who would be present by now. We drove back and spent the next four hours playing poker for pleasure. The guys had a positive attitude and understood the circumstance, so they offered help. I needed a boost of confidence for my forthcoming encounter with Claire. However, before I address the primary issue, I intend to engage in some mind games with her. I stumbled in the door shortly after 1 a.m. I purposefully exaggerated the amount I had to drink. Jerry had arranged for one of the guys to drop off my vehicle. Claire, who was waiting for me, inquired about my tardiness and scrutinized me attentively. I ignored her anxiety by adding that Jerry and the lads had dropped me off in my car, admitting to drinking a little too much J.D., ignoring my jacket and missing the coat pegs. I sat down on the sofa and looked at Claire, who had crossed her arms and was looking disgusted. I maintained a blank expression while waiting for her to speak. She couldn't keep quiet and finally asked, What's going on? Steve? Is there anyone else or something? You're acting strangely recently. I chuckled, swallowing the growing rage within me and reminding myself to relax. I am all right. My pedal went through a hard stretch recently. It will be over soon. Claire was perplexed by my remarks, but she sensed something was wrong. We went to bed and I faked to collapse, faking immediate sleep. It irritated her that she appeared prepared for a confrontation, but I refused to engage. The next morning, Claire was the first to get up and make coffee. I descended the stairs, behaving unpleasant and pretending to be hungover before approaching the kitchen. I greeted her and mentioned my severe headache. She tossed a headache remedy my way while I sipped my coffee. She was quiet and I noticed her phone on the kitchen table wondering if she had received any calls. Claire noticed my attention on her phone, and I could tell she wanted to reach for it. I calmly picked up the phone while pouring more orange juice, despite the oddity of the situation. As I intercepted a message, a panicked expression appeared on her face. I took a quick check at it before returning the phone to her, explaining that it needed to be charged to avoid a flat battery and missed messages. I left the kitchen to get dressed, leaving Claire to watch after me sensing something was wrong. She wondered if I knew. She dismissed the thought, believing she had been diligent. Their involvement had just been ongoing for a few weeks, lunches, dinners, and hotel stays three times. She saw it as nothing more than pleasure. I was confident that Steve would never find out, especially because he would not be going without. 
The news prompted her to reflect on her recent intimacy with her husband, unable to recollect the last time she considered whether her negligence had contributed to Steve's fears. I hurriedly descended the stairs and exited the door, avoiding Claire's effort at a more emotional farewell. I waved and smiled as I drove out of the driveway and headed to work at 11 a.m. I decided to send Claire a text for entertainment, expressing my regrets for the day and explaining that I had a lot on my mind, telling her that it would be settled soon. I sat back, waiting for a reaction. Later that day, Sammy paid me a visit and inquired about what had transpired. I questioned Sammy about her previous statement, wondering what she meant. Earlier in the day, a golf course employee discovered Bob Stones in the trunk of his car, severely beaten. Claire had told Sammy, and she was shaken. Sammy questioned if I had done it, and I said I didn't really care either way, denying any involvement. I went on to say that Claire told me she learned about Bob's health at a scheduled meeting with him. His company had contacted to let them know he was in the hospital, and his wife had also called. Sammy thought my story amusing and convincing, but cautioned that the next time it wouldn't be so simple for them. I was asked about my cryptic comment, and I replied that accidents happen in the most unexpected places. Claire was not there when I arrived home that night, and her car was gone. There was no message. Irritated. I contacted her phone and enthusiastically inquired about her location. She replied, saying that she was in the hospital visiting a friend and assuring me that it wouldn't be long. I expressed my hope for her friend's speedy recovery. He said a bitter goodbye and hung up before she could answer. Thirty minutes later, she returned, looking exhausted. I inquired about her friend's condition, expressing hope that it was not bad. Claire paused before responding, adding that it wasn't too dramatic. Her pal had just fallen and would return home in a few days. I recommended coffee, and she agreed, thanking me as she drank her coffee. Claire brought up an incident at work, noting that one of her company's representatives had been assaulted the night before. I expressed amazement and requested more information. She stated that he had been attacked and left in his car overnight, but reassured me that he was safe. Bob wasn't harmed too badly, and it appeared like they wanted to mess him up for no reason. There was no theft or anything. I couldn't help thinking about the contradiction. Given my previous denial of knowing Bob's update, she caught me staring at her and knew she had made a mistake. She tried to hide it, but she realized it was too late. I became aware of the problem as well. She hurriedly exited to change. I anticipated she'd be on the phone any moment. But to whom? I decided I needed to reconsider my goals because things were getting worse. I had to move things along a bit. I called Claire upstairs and told her I wanted to go out for a little bit, telling her I wouldn't be gone long. I drove to Bob Stone's home address and knocked on the door. A small, dark-haired woman opened the door. I said that my name was Steve Ryland and that my wife, Claire Ryland, had contacts with her husband. She stared at me, nervous but curious. I asked to come in for a bit in the lounge. She understood the gravity of the situation. As previously established, Claire and her husband had an affair. I apologized for having to break the news and explained her that he was currently in the hospital. She bent inward, tears falling for a few seconds, conveying her suspicions. She added that she knew he was doing it again and chose to divorce Claire. She felt Claire had had enough opportunities to come clean, and the lies were terrible. She was convinced Claire had betrayed her, despite not knowing how long the affair had lasted. When I asked her about the incident the other night, she expressed her doubts— I explained that I had not touched him and conveyed my dismay at the circumstance, suggesting that I was unconcerned about whoever had caused him harm. I said I couldn't be sorry about it. I wondered if he had been engaged with another man's wife, to which she said, Nothing shocks me. She chose to keep him out of her life, claiming that they had returned to the region because he was playing about before departing. I gave her my locksmith and solicitor contact information. Recognizing the complexities of the situation, I drove slowly home and concentrated on dealing with the other half of my problem. My inner wrath was under control. I knew that once retaliation began, it would run its course. For the most part, I would follow and like this course of action. The end of my marriage made me sad, but I knew there was no turning back from her betrayal. My only consolation was that those who had caused me sorrow would feel it considerably more intensely. I don't forgive. Update. 
I drove onto the driveway, spotting Claire's car precisely where she had left it just a few hours before and touching the hood as I passed. I approached my front door and inserted my key into its lock. A terrible feeling sank in my heart as I realized this could be the final time I did this as a married man. Stepping inside, the weight of recent worries weighed upon my shoulders, making them extremely heavy. As I strolled carefully into the room, the murmur of the television welcomed me as I approached the threshold. Claire sat on the sofa, her manner exuding anxiety and trepidation, a sensation that something was wrong, hanging in the air as if the game had ended without a word being said. She shivered nervously, attempting to retain her composure. I stood silently watching her, and as our gazes met, I sensed fear and a want to speak. But she said nothing. I walked into the room and passed her to fix myself. A drink. Staying silent. I reached for my drink, my unwavering gaze fixed on hers. She waited. I kept my expression bland as I looked at the woman I had dearly loved, sensing something was wrong. Now I'm trying to reconcile those emotions with the grief she'd given me needlessly. It was time for her to feel my pain. She noticed nothing positive about my expression as I stared. Claire straightened up, deciding to brazen it out despite what I knew. She couldn't take the incriminating silence anymore. She asked where I had been, and frustration crept into her voice as a result of my silence. I replied that I would tell her where I went if she told me where she had been. Uncertainty flared in her eyes as she persisted on visiting a buddy in the hospital. I kept a blank expression, and terror shot over her eyes. She was rattled. She deflected the question back to me, believing she had skillfully batted it away. I told her to quit the nonsense and stated that I had gone to see a friend, someone I hadn't known very long. Our talk was vital, and despite the fact that I had never met her before, we were suddenly friends. I had an enlightening conversation with her about her husband, Bob Stones, and inquired whether she had heard of him. Her cheeks flushed as I played with her emotions. I mentioned that I wanted to speak with the Stones woman about her husband's adultery, since she had discovered his affair in response to my revelation. She expressed concern, asking whether I was all right and offering to fetch me a drink. I asked about her knowledge of Bob Stone's affairs. Watching her struggle to find words, I took the initiative and told her that I had known about her relationship with Bob for a long. I urged her to say up before departing, emphasizing that it meant nothing and was only a sign of friendship. I sneered at her explanations, reminding her of our vows while she proceeded to defend herself. I called her out, expressing my dissatisfaction with her lying. I pointed out that she treated me like a fool and her attempts to minimize the affair irritated me. I sarcastically remarked on the claim that it only happened twice and wondered if it was worth our marriage. She apologized, stating it didn't mean anything and offering to make it up to me. I chuckled harshly, accusing her of being remorseful for getting caught and wondering if she would have quit if not exposed. I claimed that all of the lies she told had become second nature, and only she believed them. I told her she wasn't the lady I fell in love with and married, and she looked at me, the weight of my pain beginning to permeate her cheater's veneer. She grasped the gravity of the situation and inquired what she could do, promised to accomplish anything. I told her we were done and contacted Sammy to advise her of the situation. Sammy would be arriving soon to fetch her up. Claire was shocked. When asked where she would go, I answered sharply, saying she could go wherever she wanted even returned to the hospital to visit her boyfriend. I didn't care. We were finished. Claire sat shocked when there was a knock at the door. I met Sammy and instructed her to get Claire out of here. I emphasized that if she didn't go, I was worried about what I would do to her. I still cared about her, despite my hatred for what she had done, but it was time for her to leave. Sammy hurriedly gathered Claire's belongings for the following few days. I thanked Sammy for her support and stated that I will be in touch shortly. As Sammy readied Claire to go, I heard my wife sob. Sammy quickly packed Claire's possessions into two suitcases, and she was gone from my house in less than ten minutes. The true task would be to get her out of my life forever and heal the pain. Retribution could assist with that. Staring into the flames of the pyre I'd erected in the backyard, Claire's entire possessions were on fire as I watched. I wouldn't let her back into my house for anything. Here is the next story. 
Tyson Summers completed the final set of documents provided by Jason that were critical to Jason's management of a specific portfolio, one of the largest under Ty's responsibilities. This portfolio contained the possessions of Wilson Graves, a wealthy businessman and entrepreneur known fondly as Willie Graves. Willie thrived on utilizing his fortune to launch aggressive takeovers, buying stocks to seize control. Willie's successful strategy included quick disposal to increase the value of his investments and to involve other trustworthy persons. Damn those who were injured. Ty, Willie's lawyer and legal adversary, effectively maintained Wilson's honesty and kept him out of problems with the SEC and other federal officials investigating persons such as Graves. This enabled Willie to accumulate additional wealth, helping Summers, Reinhardt, and Haynes Inc. Jason also made progress in portfolio management for his other clients, with the goal of achieving complete control within the next two weeks. This would complete the three-month process of transferring all of Ty's clients. Except for his particular clients, Ty's planned retirement was known only to Jason Stacy Reinhardt and Clayton Haynes. Ty told himself once more that it was time to let go and prioritize his own time. As one of the firm's founding fathers, together with Stacy and Clay, they helped grow it from a modest storefront law office to one of Columbus, Ohio's largest and most powerful. However, Ty's success had an impact on his personal life, including his marriage to Bridget and their family. Ty and Bridget celebrated their 20th wedding anniversary last month. They have two children, 19-year-old Jake and 18-year-old Tessa, who are both prospering in college. Despite the monetary luxuries, Ty saw that Bridget's apathy in their love relationship was a serious problem. While Ty's lovemaking urge persisted, Bridget attributed her reduced libido to a passing phase, promising to discuss it with her doctor at her next appointment, which was over a year ago. Their love life had improved, and Ty, frustrated, decided to let the topic go without further debate. His anxiety stemmed from Bridget's frequent excursions back to her hometown of Mansfield, Ohio. She said that departure was owing of her mother's poor health and that her sister Bianca, who resided there, required assistance. Both remained in Mansfield, and Bianca, divorced and alone, profited from Bridget's presence during these trips. Bridget believed that was the least she could do to relieve Bianca and give her some free time. These visits began six months ago and are now done bi-monthly, with Bridget leaving on Thursday morning and returning late Sunday night. She kept in touch by calling every evening at 9 o'clock and making sure her cell phone was always accessible. However, this meant Ty had to spend three or four days alone every other week, which he disliked. Bridget left this morning on her latest trip, leaving Ty alone once more. Despite his disappointment, he told Bridget that he was working on a big surprise, ready in a few weeks. He even tried to pique her interest by mentioning Stacy's involvement, hoping that her curiosity or even jealousy of Stacy would compel her to stay and find out the truth. Bridget showed little interest and Ty was not surprised. Let it go and left her to pack. Ty left for work after saying their usual goodbyes, knowing she'd be gone within an hour. Later that day, Ty closed up his office, chatted with Rachel, his secretary, and proceeded down the carpeted hall to Stacy's office for a word before returning home. He knocked once and pushed the door open. A habit acknowledged by all partners accustomed to his surprise visits. Ty greeted Stacy and suggested they finish work for the day, offering to buy a drink. Stacy stated her hesitation to go home to an empty house. Another colleague, Roger, was waiting for her as they planned to attend their son's school play, where Roger Jr. had the lead role in Pirates of Doom. Ty teased Stacy about the play, but acknowledged that parents are naturally biased when it comes to their children's performances. Stacy laughed and agreed. At 46, happily married for the past 10 years, she reassured Ty about the progress on the project and declined assistance from Jason, noting that everything was on track. Concerned about Ty's upcoming retirement, Stacy expressed her wish to talk him out of it, emphasized that he had been the driving force behind the company's success. Ty complimented Stacy's contributions and assured her that she, along with Clay and the younger team members, would continue to excel. He praised the younger generation's dedication, particularly mentioning Jason and expressing the possibility of offering Alice Chambers a partnership in the future. Stacy expressed her liking for Jason and Alice and mentioned that Raj would also attend the upcoming party. Ty welcomed Raj and bid Stacy good night. 
planning to see her the next day. Ty drove to his estate home in the Columbus suburbs, situated on a five-acre lot and encompassing just over 5,000 staff. It featured a hot tub flowing into a pool, a cabana, two tennis courts, and a spacious garden with flowers and flowering shrubs providing color throughout the summer and into the fall, with the departure of the kids. Bridget had let go of the cook and maid, leaving the house mostly empty. Acknowledging that it was too large for the two of them, Bridget agreed they hadn't committed to it, but suggested it was time to consider moving into something smaller. Maybe they should give it a couple more years, she proposed. Ty parked in the four-car garage and entered the kitchen where he placed a frozen dinner in the microwave before changing into casual clothes for the evening. Returning down the steps, he heard the landline ring, hoping it was related to one of his ads, as it was too early for Bridget to call answering the call. He was thrilled to describe his boat, a 32-foot powered sailboat moored at Lake Erie in the summer and fall. Winter stored at a facility on the lake. After a fruitful discussion with someone who had taken the boat for a run with the marina owner covering for Ty, the deal was finalized. An arrangement was formed to deliver a cashier's check for the agreed-upon sum to a post office box number Ty supplied. Once the check was received, the title to the boat would be available at the marina. The purchaser had studied the title when taking the boat out for a trial run. Everything was in place. Bridget, who had never liked the boat and hadn't been out with Ty in years, would be thrilled with the boat sold and his Jaguar and Audi promised two successful high bids. There was little left to worry about. Two weeks from today, everything would be in order for his retirement. The house might take a while to sell, but by then, Ty and Bridget would be in the smaller bungalow ready for showings. He had already moved some furniture there, and any extra pieces might be acquired as needed. Ty mechanically gobbled the frozen dinner and decided to relax with mindless TV and munchies. Taking a bottle of cool Miller Lite to the entertainment room, he picked for adult content contemplating the lack of imagination in the scenarios as the performers repeated the same activities in the same way. The movie failed to enrage him sufficiently to take matters into his own hands while the film unfolded. Ty puzzled why the actors all followed the same script, gazing into the camera without any imaginative flair, only trying for titillation. He lacked the enthusiasm to engage in personal interests. At nine, Bridget phoned and Ty answered, asking about any troubles getting there. Bridget assured him of a smooth flight and noted that her mom was doing a little better. But her sister Bianca was anxious. She offered staying an extra day if it was okay with Ty. Despite the agony in his gut, Ty consented, urging Bridget to do what she believed was best. He said he'd remain at work a bit longer because it was lonely without her. Ty also questioned about Monday, asking if she needed anything and noticing that she hadn't brought much with her. Bridget stated that she had left some belongings behind and convinced Ty that she would be okay. She immediately brought up the surprise he had mentioned earlier, eager to find out what it was. Ty, astonished by her curiosity, informed her that everything was on track with Stacy, that she was almost finished with her part, and that the rest was already in place. Bridget promised to call him tomorrow night and wished him evening. Ending the call with a simple, I love you. Ty observed Bridget's haste to finish the call swiftly and noted that she did not return his I love you with more than a good night. Despite this, he grinned, attributing her rapid ends to her possible hectic schedule with her mother. Ty then thought on Bridget's family dynamics, noticing the chaos and his own dislike for her mother and sister, Bianca, who had been divorced for cheating. So, my weekend alone continues. Ty considered how he could keep himself occupied, he called the kids and spoke to them for an hour or more, remind them of his summons to come down in two weeks, and then simply let himself leave. He fell asleep on the couch and woke up in the middle of the night with a stiff neck. He went to bed and had no dreams. This was odd, but Ty welcomed it. Recently, his dreams had not been pleasant. Ty spent the next two weeks concentrating on finishing all of his cases and ensuring Jason was up to date on them. He spent much of the second week calling his clients and informing them of his impending retirement. They were mostly thrilled for him and eager to work with Jason. A few people needed guarantees from either Stacy or Clayton, so he made sure they were reached immediately away. Everything was in place by the final Thursday, 
when Bridget went for Mansfield. Ty had kept his impending retirement a secret from Bridget as intended. She rarely inquired about his employment anymore, so it wasn't much of an issue. In addition, she had forgotten about the surprise, and Ty did not bring it up again before leaving. He'd bring it up on Sunday morning when she called to say she was leaving, especially if she decided to stay another day. Regardless, Ty was prepared. Ty's final day was full with buzzing activities. They cleaned the house with Rachel and transferred paper files to Jason after a few phone calls. Ty directed Rachel to transfer all of his new calls to Jason in accordance with his strategy. Rachel had worked with Jason's secretary previously. Ty's last morning task was to tell Stacy to get things started, and she confirmed that she was ready. She left for the courthouse later that morning. Stacy pledged to return on time for the Radisson Hotel's retiring celebration. Despite everyone's knowledge that Bridget would be unable to attend, the activities continued on schedule, promising a pleasant day. Ty left shortly after lunch to do numerous important duties, and by three o'clock that afternoon, everything was in place. The final paperwork for the house had been signed, and movers were already on their way, committed to complete by late Saturday afternoon. Once the movers were finished, the staff hired to properly clean the home would arrive with instructions to finish the job by that evening. They were offered a bonus if they finished on time. Realtors told Ty that the for-sale sign will be in the front yard by late tomorrow, showing a list of interested parties who want to inspect the home beginning the following Monday to their satisfaction. Ty had priced it competitively to ensure a quick sale. Ty's last responsibility was to ensure that all financial arrangements were in place. Aside from the combined accounts, Bridget and he maintained two separate accounts, each with a credit card. Ty insisted that they only carry one card apiece, disapproving of maintaining a credit balance. Bridget, an expert at financial management, was never wasteful with money. She expertly managed their finances. Bridget, who was aware of Ty's private business accounts managed by his company, but not of Ty's accounts at the firm, had never inquired about or remembered retiring throughout the years. Ty closed all joint accounts under both their names, transferring a retirement account to a new brokerage. Ty wanted to manage all of their joint affairs in cash, at least temporarily, until they had reached an agreement. The new residence would be placed outside of the United States. Ty expands the accounts beyond the United States, having previously created an online account with an international bank with locations in Europe and South America. Ty was certain that Bridget would easily adapt to the shift because she was quite knowledgeable about finances. Ty finally confirmed that the tickets were in hand, thinking of spending the next few months with Bridget in a nice Costa Rican resort. Sun, sand, swimming, sailing, and horseback riding. They had it everything. Ty, who had made a solo trip to the resort to ensure its authenticity, directed Rachel to arrange the vacation and make the reservations. I want everything to be confirmed. Tyson was well off by the time he retired, having amassed a sizable fortune from managing high-profile cases for wealthy clients. Charging accordingly, his clients recognized his expertise and retained him with large retainers. Ty placed his profits in high-risk accounts, which generated considerable returns over time. As a lawyer, he used his legal skills to legally move the majority of his money into offshore accounts, with no agreements with the United States. Bridget had no idea that these accounts had remained intact, which added to the surprise. If she were aware, she would be astounded by their value. Importantly, this money was not subject to U.S. tax regulations, and the U.S. courts had assured that everyone in the corporation kept silent about it. Despite Bridget's suggestion to retire, it was dropped during the last year. Ty expected his retirement to delight her, given her complaints about the time he spent at work. He assured everyone that it would be a surprise for Bridget, with plans to reveal everything on Sunday night when she returned. Ty was confident she'd be home Sunday and planned to start the surprise during her morning call. So far, everything had been flawless. Ty enjoyed the party, dancing with all of the women and talking to all of the men about their most interesting war memories. Jason spent the majority of his time with Ty, making sure that nothing important went unnoticed. Ty admired Jason for seeing him as a strong asset to the organization. As his attorneys, Stacy and Clay were sworn to secrecy and were aware of all of his plans. 
Stacy discreetly exhibited satisfaction with what he was doing. Ty danced with her, talking about the last movements. Stacy informed Ty that everything was ready for the surprise, and she documented checks and numbers to ensure Bridget's surprise and Ty's happiness. Ty expressed confidence that Bridget would appreciate the surprise, and Stacy agreed with a snarky whisper. Ty laughed and revealed that he had tickets to a Costa Rica resort and planned to leave Sunday night. He promised to call her with a permanent number, but said his new cell would be active in the interim. He advised that Roger and Stacy do something similar. Stacy said that she appreciated what she was doing too much to quit right now. Ty encouraged her to apologize to Clay for not including him in any of their plans. Ty remained at the gathering until around midnight before departing. He missed Bridget's call but discovered a voicemail. Bridget informed Ty that she was heading to her mother's house that night and asked him not to contact her there to prevent waking her up. She stated that her mother was always fatigued and needed to relax. Bridget promised to phone Ty the next night and ask him to be home. She beat him. Good night, as Ty predicted. She didn't call tonight after leaving a message. He spent the entire packing his clothes and making sure Bridget's possessions were nicely packed with little time before Sunday night. Ty hoped to avoid returning trips after the movers finished tomorrow. Be careful and methodical. He packed her belongings, guaranteeing a seamless process with no space for complaints. He intended to stay at the cottage overnight and guarantee that any calls were redirected to his new phone. Starts tomorrow. Once he had moved everything to the bungalow, Ty completed his responsibilities and called to assure the final element of the surprise was in place. Then I went to bed, pleasantly weary from the party and on edge. He hoped nothing would go wrong when he fell asleep. On Saturday, the furniture was packed and moved from their home. Despite his sadness, Ty shrugged his shoulders and left the movers to their job. He was heading back to the bungalow to meet their children. Ty arrived about midday and needed to go over his intentions with them so as not to surprise them too much. He had hinted at his retirement but suppressed information regarding Costa Rica or anything else. Now it was time to bring them up to date. He had to obtain assurances from them not to phone Bridget and ruin his surprise, believing they would be fine with it. When they arrived, he welcomed them inside and set them down to begin filling them in, keeping it brief and to the point. He answered all of their questions and provided information when they requested them. Neither Jake nor Tessa were pleased with what Dad was doing, but he assured them that their college tuition was covered and that they would always be welcome home wherever that was. He informed them that his retirement was something he and Bridget had discussed and agreed on as the appropriate moment. They wanted to talk to Bridget, but he made them agree to wait until Sunday night when she returned home. Finally, they reached an agreement. They all went out to eat that evening and remained silent. Ty answered Bridget's nine o'clock call. She kept it brief, as she always does, but made no mention of staying any longer. So he was still expecting her. After the call on Sunday night, the kids went over his plans again to be sure he still wanted to go ahead with them. Ty assured them that he was all right as they went to sleep in the spare room with twin beds. He called to check that the movers were finished and that the cleaning company was scheduled. Both agreed, and Ty was thrilled. With one more call, he was done for the night. Sunday was a day when little needed to be done, and almost everything was ready. He checked the house and found everything in place. The movers and cleaners had left the apartment pristine and ready for viewing. He drove back to the bungalow and waited for Bridget to call and inform him she was ready to leave. He expected her to call between 10 and 10.30. The kids had gone out with some of their friends from home, so Ty was alone when she called. He responded after the first ring. Ty cautiously asked Bridget whether she was prepared to leave for home. She said that she was just getting started and that she would want to remain a few more days to allow her sister Bianca more time to do things. Bridget's tone seemed tight, as if she expected Ty to object. He was well aware that her request would not be acceptable. Ty heard the words and felt the wrath that he had been suppressing for months, straining to release. She wanted to stay for a few days longer. Why? So he knew now, didn't he? He'd known for more than three months, enough time to organize his surprise. It was time to put his surprise to the forefront. It was now time to carry out the plans he had made during the previous three months. Once, he knew for sure. Now it was time. Ty's rage flared up as he made this decision. 
Having kept it under control for so long, with the fury making it difficult to talk without shouting, he responded to Bridget's plea by sarcastically referring to her lover, Kevin. Ty confronted her about her relationship with Kevin and another man, Ben, saying it upset him. His voice increased in rage and he tried not to scream at her. Ty accused her of having these connections for the past six months or more. He was frustrated that he had to pretend it wasn't a big deal. Silence followed from the other end, interrupted only by a sob. And then the phone died. Ty gazed at the phone in his grasp, as if it were a snake waiting to attack. He discovered that Bridget had hung up, which was an unwelcome surprise. He eventually placed the offending instrument on the table, his palm quivering with rage. Ty collapsed into the chair next to the table as she hung up, leaving him with no outlet for his pent-up rage. His phone rang sharply. He stared at it, unable to understand Lee while the music resonated through the walls. The disposable phone he had acquired for this purpose continued to ring with no voicemail. Finally, he picked it up and pressed the talk button. Yes, that was all he could get out. His rage had boiled over with the abrupt conclusion of everything. He had prepared for an argument or a yelling fight, a scream fest between the unfaithful wife and her enraged husband. Her quick termination took him by surprise and quenched his rage like a bucket of water on a fire. He was now lifeless, dead inside, and numb from the pain he had suppressed with his plan of action. Without a therapeutic outlet for his rage and pain, he was immediately unable to stop the piercing pain that gripped his heart. Bianca's outraged voice rang out, the little speaker asking Ty not to hang up and expressing concern for Bridget, who was described as a wreck and nearly hysterical. She questioned Ty about what he had said to Bridget and what he had done to elicit such a strong reaction. Ty turned his rage toward Bianca, seeing her as an equal collaborator in Bridget's betrayal and as culpable as his cheating wife. He cynically told Bianca that he had just encouraged Bridget to remain as long as she wanted to spend more time with her lover, Kevin Clark. Ty accused Bianca and Bridget of being associated with Ben Stinson and Kevin, recounting their meeting at a motel. He became enraged, preventing himself from yelling at Bianca and dismissing her request for him to let Bridget explain. Bianca attempted to defend Bridget, arguing that it wasn't what Ty assumed and presenting the scenario as a dumb error in which she was equally to blame. She pleaded with Ty not to do something extreme and advised him to wait until Bridget could speak with him. Ty, on the other hand, refused to back down, stating that someone would be waiting for Bridget, but it would not be him. He accused Bridget of abandoning their marriage and claiming that she intended to continue her affair with Kevin. Despite Bianca's pleadings, Ty informed her that he had already told their children about the situation, including weekends when Bridget claimed to be caring for her mother. Ty claimed that the children had taken the news surprisingly well in response to Bianca's frantic plea for hope and reconsideration. Ty maintained that it was Bridget and Bianca who had abandoned their family. Ty said goodbye to Bianca and addressed saying goodbye to her mother, commenting that she had never liked him and was probably laughing her skinny buns off. Ty unplugged and gazed around the small home for the final time. He thought to himself, Bridget will love it. He laughed at the concept. He switched off the lights, placed the spare keys on the table, along with the letter to Bridget, and exited the front door. He closed the door, got in his rented car, and went to Rachel's apartment. As he approached the building, she waited for him in front of it. He stepped out, carried her three suitcases into the rear of the car, and then held the door open as she climbed inside. She grinned up at him as he closed the car door. He strolled around to the driver's side and slid in. Rachel indicated her readiness for the scenario, citing the difficulty of seeing him every day at the office, but being unable to touch or speak with him. She thanked Bridget for tossing Ty away, allowing her to pick him up and spend their weekends together. They drove away from Bridget's story, and Rachel explained that when she called Ty to ask if he mind if she stayed for a few more days, she got an odd feeling that it might not be the best idea. She relayed her chat with Bianca, who chuckled at the prospect of spending more time with Kevin and Ben. Rachel acknowledged to experiencing a tinge of remorse when she thought about her time with both of them, but that regret was overshadowed by her lustful fantasies. When she thought of Kevin and Ben... She felt a rush of wetness between her legs. I shuddered once before picking up the phone. 
The discussion began as usual, with Ty inquiring if I was coming home. He sounded so normal, reminding me that this was a world Ty was unfamiliar with, and it gave me the courage to pursue what I knew I wanted. I went for it, asking him whether he would mind if I stayed for a few days. When I looked at Bianca, her grin convinced me that I was doing the right thing. As I waited for his usual response, which was to do whatever made me happy, I reminded myself that Ty would not mind and would never know what I was doing. I would never tell him because it would hurt him so badly. I adored Ty. That was real. But lovemaking with him had lost its charm for me. And now I'd found a way to continue to love my husband while also enjoying lovemaking with another person. With him, I discovered a wild part of myself that I had never expected. I was completely immersed in the forbidden pleasure he provided me. I was happy with myself, which fueled my desire to spend one or two more nights with Kevin and Ben. I was already picturing our night together, and I was getting warm just thinking about it, when those words came out of the speaker's mouth and hit me square in the gut, ruining my world. Ty questioned why he should be concerned about Bridget's desire to spend more nights with her partner, Kevin, considering her relationship with both him and another guy, Ben. Ty questioned the duration, wondering if it had been six months or longer. He expressed his annoyance as if he was meant to pretend it was nothing. Bridget couldn't respond to Ty's charges. I was frozen with terror and panic. I slammed down the phone and sobbed loudly. Only one. I was able to leave before everything became evident to me. God. He knew. And my life was over. I was about to lose the only man I ever loved. I needed to get home. I had to leave now to capture him before he could do something dreadful. I grabbed my car keys and bolted out of Bianca's kitchen. I started my car and backed out of her driveway. I turned and headed toward the interstate and home. I needed to get home. I had to. I regularly drove for three and a half to four hours, but now I was driving as fast as my automobile could go. I was impervious to any threat from the cops that patrolled the freeway, and I didn't care about speed restrictions. I had to get home before Ty could leave me. I needed to talk to him, tell him I loved him, and that I was an idiot. I'd done something dumb and selfish, but it didn't matter to me. Kevin and Ben had already gone. I would never see them or Bianca again in my entire life. I would tell him that if he stayed with me forever, I would abandon everyone else. I practiced the words. I'd try to persuade him not to throw me away. I was tempted by Bianca and her lifestyle, and she assured me that the lack of my love-making desire would go away if I let myself go with someone I didn't have to please or care about. She persuaded me that this would rekindle my love-making desire and that Ty would benefit. I was only going to try to reclaim my drive. But then I was tempted by the lust and excitement of doing something naughty. It would rejuvenate me, and I would bring it back to my marriage bed with my spouse. I was pleased about that. It would work. Ty would listen. He had to go 100 miles later. I asked the question. Ty would wonder, why didn't any of that lust carry over? Why hadn't we made love in the six months since I started my affair? I didn't have an answer to that query. I needed to think of one. I needed to think. I was still trying to think of words to answer that question. When I arrived into our driveway, I was surprised to see four cars there. I recognized my children's two cars and was startled to see them there. But nearly as fast, I felt a sense of fear in their presence. I drove around them onto the grass, skidded to a stop, and climbed out of my car to sprint toward the house. I saw someone get out of one of the weird automobiles and approach me at the front door. I ignored the man and reached for my keys. He attempted to stop me, but I shoved him aside and inserted my key into the lock. It did not work. I tried repeatedly, but it didn't work. I flung it on the porch, buried my face in my hands, and started crying. I turned towards the door and began hammering on it with my fists. I pounded till the ache in my hands made me stop. I looked around and saw that the man who got out of the automobile was still standing there. He inquired whether I was Mrs. Tyson Summers, and I nodded affirmatively. He handed me an envelope and stated quietly, You are served, madam. He then took another, smaller packet and handed it to me. These are the keys to your new home. The address is inside, and the property is yours without obligation. You will find the deed and other relevant information within. I took both envelopes and simply stared at him. My mind was numb from sadness and pain. He reached into his coat pocket and handed me a legal-size white envelope. 
This contained multiple checks for the current savings and checking accounts, which had been closed. This residence has been advertised for sale and the funds will be sent to you after the transaction is complete. All of this is included in the divorce documents and the terms are quite clearly stated. The man closed his briefcase and prepared to go. He reached into his jacket pocket and took out a business card. In case you forgot, this is the name of your husband's lawyer. He stepped away and got into his car. He spoke with the person sitting in the other car, whom I did not identify before backing out and driving away. I was startled when I held the envelopes the stranger had given me. I looked down at the business card and noticed that it was Stacy Reinhardt. That name sparked a lightning of rage down my back, but it swiftly subsided. Stacy was a problem only in my imagination. I knew that. But over the years, I'd used it as a wedge to make Ty feel guilty. I knew better now, but it didn't help when I looked up and saw her approaching. Hello, Bridget. You're not looking so good today. I just wanted to let you know. Ty requested me to manage everything in his absence. I can address some of your inquiries. First, Ty retired on Friday. We all held a party for him. It was a fantastic celebration, and many people gathered to see him off. Too bad you missed it. But you had other priorities, didn't you? Second, the residence has been given over to a broker for sale. Ty utilized the power of attorney you signed to transfer the title into his name. But don't worry, the profits are entirely for you. Ty left it to you during the divorce. He also got you a lovely cottage, paid and provided. Your kids can take you there. Finally, Ty gave me complete authority to act on his behalf in the divorce and all of his business here in the States. Ty has left the nation, and I assume he intends not to return for some time. She stood there, observing me while I processed what she told me. It felt as if each was a hammer striking the stake in my heart. I was almost gasping for air when I realized how quickly my life had fallen apart. When I opened my mouth to ask questions, nothing came out. I realized I had been smacked by a man I had betrayed and mistreated so casually, a man I knew in my heart was the only one I could ever love. I had lost his love and didn't know what to do. I was suddenly more alone than I had been in the previous twenty years. I had my children and my life, but... I had lost my connection to everything I cared about in this world. I had never felt more alone in my life. I can't understand why you did this to Tyson, Bridget. Working with him for the past 15 years has taught me that he adored you and his children beyond all else. When he discovered what you were up to, he nearly killed himself. Roger and I helped him get through the crisis and kept him calm enough to make plans to deal with you. We made certain he did not do something dumb. Just so you know, he pondered self-harm. But we talked him out of it by telling him about your children. He's currently with someone else who has also supported him through the problem you caused with your actions. It does not matter who she is, just that she is with him and will look after him as things takes its course. Tyson will not consent to speak with you, and he doesn't care whether you contest the divorce. It will be in my hands, not his, so do whatever you want. Just know that Tyson has left your life and will never return. She turned and walked back to her car, not looking back. She got into the passenger seat and the automobile drove away. I walked slowly down the driveway toward my children, who were waiting near the automobiles. I had to confront them and listen to their rage and judgment, but I didn't care anymore. I deceived my husband, their father, and lost him. Nothing else mattered. Their outrage at me would make no difference. Nothing they could say or do could hurt me more than Ty's words that morning. Oh, how they ache. And all he did was tell the facts as he saw them. As I came to a halt in front of Jake and Tessa, my anguish forced me to kneel. Jake bent down to help me stand, but his expression was unconcerned when I gazed at him. I noticed wrath, disdain, and disappointment, but no worry. That was painful for me. And I started sobbing. Instead of holding me, my daughter stood in front of me, arms crossed over her chest, her expression echoing that of her brother. After losing Ty in my marriage, I believed myself that it couldn't get any worse. However, the looks on my children's faces informed me unequivocally how they perceived what I did, and it got even worse. I cried for what I'd lost. My children stood by and waited. They provided no comfort. I'd also lost them. I turned and took another look at the house Ty and I had bought to raise our family. I adored that mansion and always felt proud when I returned home. Now it was gone. Everything was gone. 
my husband, my marriage, the love for my children, and the house we shared. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe if you have not already. If you have a story to share regarding your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.